Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're listening. I'm Charles Galda. Welcome to the Church in Action podcast, where we talk about issues of God and culture to accelerate our ability to make disciples who do justice and share Jesus to transform New England and the world. Uh, when when we, we believe when the people of God are doing the work of God, that's a quote from A.J. Gordon, it's evangelistic. Uh, people want to know our Jesus. So today we're talking about uh, doing justice. Uh, we have a clear obligation description to love our neighbor, which requires action, not just words. And we do that when we serve people, uh, when we do justice, when we're fixing those things that violate God's pre-fall order for the world, when we prevent shalom in our communities and societies, and right? we're doing those things or we create for shalom in our societies, it opens doors to sharing Jesus because people want to know why we're so different. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We've got a great guest with us. Uh, you're, you're going to enjoy the conversation. I think Joyce Shetler Holt uh, leads Hagar Sisters, uh, which serves hundreds of women every year, uh, providing safety, planning, resources, referrals, legal services, support groups uh, for people who are in a situation of domestic abuse. Before we jump into the conversation, but Joyce, welcome uh, for being, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Charles. It's a pleasure to be with you. And before we jump into the conversation, just to set it up, we've got a, a video Joyce uh, has provided uh, that kind of gives us a, an introductory understanding of what we want to talk about today. So I'll ask our producer, Ashley, if she'd just play that video for us. I think Hagar Sisters is really important um, as a support network for women that are in positions of domestic violence. You feel very alone in that, in that position. To have the understanding that there are other people that share your experience when you feel like you maybe are the only one in that place is, is so empowering just from the get-go. And then to be able to learn more about that whole the whole um, cycle of domestic violence and to understand and put put words and definitions to your life experience really helps you process it so well. I think the biggest change that I experienced as a result of going through Hagar Sisters programs is just my understanding and application of grace and forgiveness. Nobody ever really talked about what that means if you're being abused. So. Coming to Hair Sisters, learning about grace and forgiveness, but also learning about my own worth and value and how much God wants me to also protect myself, I think it corrected a lot of um, unhealthy theology that I had. I had had to wear a mask for so long and pretend for so long and try to get out of the zombie zone knowing something was wrong but didn't couldn't put a word to it couldn't put a storyline to it i mean even people who wanted to help didn't understand just didn't get it and so hagar sisters got me out of my cloud got me out of zombie zone and allowed me to be kali and loved kali loved on kali prayed with kali cried with kali dressed kali fed kali and they're still here, still here those many years later for Kali. And that's so rich and priceless relationship that I have with Hagar's that I will love for life. Thanks for that video, Joyce. That's a really great way to tee up the conversation. Why don't you tell us what Hagar's sisters is how it got started. Um, okay. Well, um, why don't I start with um, how we got started and that will um, be a good lead in to uh, what we do. So Hagar Sisters started um, when five Christian women from a single church congregation realized that they had something uh, in common that none of them wished they would. And that was that they were each experiencing intimate partner abuse from their Christian husbands. Um, men who were practicing uh, Christianity and the rest is for God to, to um, decide. Uh, people often bring that question up, but um, with, um, with the women, 
there was a, a question of, um, well, I was, I was one of the women. So we, many of us had gone to the church to ask for help um, and um, gotten messages that were really made us feel trapped. Um, messages about divorce and submission, um, forgiveness, um, and things along on that along that line. So um, then, some of the women went to a local domestic violence agency and got messages that were directly contradictory to those that they received in the church. And you know, those messages were. Um, you know, you have to find safety instead of you can't leave. Um, instead of submit, you decide um, what's best for you. Instead of uh, forgive, um, we were told that abusers rarely change. Um, instead of God hates divorce, we were told that uh, divorce was really a natural outcome of abuse. So um, as Christian survivors, you know, we really felt trapped between the two worlds. Um, and, and it was a real challenge because we didn't have anywhere that we could go um, that could address, uh, address both needs. So we started meeting together in my home and um, there were five of us. And um, within the first two and a half years, we grew from five to 63 women. And that really was um, with no effort on our part um, because we were, we were all going through really devastating experiences um, and everything like that. So the organization grew um, and, and that's, how we, that's how we got our start. And, and so, so Joyce, I just want to uh, ask a, maybe a level deeper on that, but I don't want, sure. but please don't hear me asking you to share anything you're not comfortable sharing. I appreciate that, but I, I do share my story openly. Yeah. And, and so um, what I think I heard you saying is you went to a pastor in your church or so you went to a pastor in your church uh, and talked about how you were being uh, physically and or emotionally, mentally abused. And their answer was, you need to submit um, and you, you need to forgive, um, not you need to get to safety. Um, so when I responded to the, the messages from the church, they weren't necessarily messages that I received. They were messages that we received collectively okay. as a, a group of women. But, uh, but yes, my, the messages I received um, were in that grouping. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, so I'm, I'm struggling with why anybody's first reaction to that wouldn't be, you need to get to safety, but what was, um, was there no, was there not a concern for it? I'm sorry. I don't, maybe I'm asking too much. Yeah. Was there not a concern? Yeah. I mean, that would be my first reaction is you need to get out, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the church really was, um, having difficulty um, because my husband was uh, also a member of the church and, um, uh, you know, nobody realizes what's going on. Um, it's, it's held as a tightly uh, closed secret um, between, uh, you know, you don't necessarily disclose that. Um, what's going on in your home to anyone. So it's really big when somebody does make that disclosure. Um, and I, I think that the church um, didn't understand abuse, that they um, had no idea what to do. And it was especially complex because we were both in the church. Um, we, we were both in the choir when we were, um, there was a restraining order also involved. So, you know, what do you do um, with a couple where you have the he said, she said, um, and there's a restraining order. So, um, so it was, it was a really difficult situation. And now that I'm working with pastors, I've, I've had a pastor um, refer um, 
a woman in his congregation who was in need and actually during couples counseling asked both of them to call Hagar sisters, um, which is not the right solution. <laughs> um, so, um, but it was amazing and it really helped me understand the challenges that pastors face um, when this situation comes because even though I had worked in the domestic violence industry and am a survivor myself, it was very difficult um, to separate out um, because both claimed abusive type behaviors in the other. Um, but that's where Hagar's sisters really shines. And, and so this group grows to 60 plus kind of organically from people hearing about it. I assume now that there's those are women from multiple churches at that point. That's not all within one church. Correct. Correct. They were they were throughout the uh, kind of uh, North Shore. Metro West areas. Mm -hmm. so, so north of Boston into kind of middle middle Massachusetts for, for folks who may not be as familiar with the geography. Yes. And, all women from churches. Um, yes, initially they were all from churches. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we had uh, Bonnie Gatchel on a few months back uh, talking about in the human trafficking space. And I know you know Bonnie, but she also did research in, in this space and she was sharing the same thing that um, not just there was domestic abuse in the church, but there was there, but pastors were sometimes domestic abusers too, which I think we, we, we find shocking, um, but need to recognize that it is an issue in the church um, and we need solutions for that. And we need right. to, to figure out ways to provide safety. And so I, I, I always think that the reason we talk about that this week is in our podcast, we kind of alternate between topics about justice um, the second uh, Thursday of the month. And this is a justice topic. I think some people get nervous when they hear justice because they assume a political agenda or they assume we're trying to take Jesus out of the gospel. But this is this is one of those things that I'm not living the life God intended for me here if I'm living in the circumstances these women are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. so so very much a justice issue. So so can you maybe just, let's step back for a second, if we could, mm -hmm. is you, you use the phrase intimate partner uh, abuse, I think it was, or I used yeah. abuse. Help, help me a little bit with the lexicon and help me with the problem. Help, give us a little bit of an insight into how pervasive and stuff like that. Sure. Um, within the category of abuse, there are all kinds of abuse. There's child abuse, elder abuse, um, familial abuse, which can happen between um, siblings or um, something like that. But when we're talking about someone in a romantic context, if you will, um, uh, we refer to that as intimate partner. So it can be um, not only someone who's married, but someone who is dating. Um, so intimacy, doesn't necessarily mean sexual intimacy. Um, yeah, so does that help? Um, so you'll hear me use words, um, for instance, um, domestic violence is, um, and, and the terms tend to be used differently by different people, but domestic violence is kind of the umbrella phrase, if you will, um, domestic violence. Um, in the, um, in the domestic violence community, you're starting to hear people use the word domestic abuse more because when you use domestic violence, people think of physical abuse and abuse can be emotional, it can be intellectual, it can be financial, um, it can be sexual and it's also spiritual. Um, so, when Hagar Sisters is founded and serves women who have experienced intimate partner abuse, and they don't have to know, um, one of the biggest challenges for women is they know that something's wrong and they might have gone through all kinds of counseling and read all kinds of self-help books to try to figure out what in the world, how can they be a better wife? How, what are they doing wrong? You know, they, the, the pattern is that they will take on the blame. Um, and, um, you know, so helping women understand that, um, 
you know, what they're experiencing is in fact intimate partner abuse um, is one of the keys. Um, but you mentioned that pastors um, also are people who are abusive, can be abusive. And um, that's true. And, and it is shocking. I personally, I think it should be shocking that any person that calls themselves a Christian would uh, be abusive, um, whether they're pastor or, or not. Um, but um, abuse is about power and control. Most people think that it's anger. And that, you know, what did you do that made him so angry? Well, the truth is that you really didn't have to do anything at any point. And, and let me also back up because I keep saying he and she as uh, he being the abusive partner and she being uh, the, the person who's experiencing abuse. Um, men are also abused. Um, so... Uh, the statistics say that of the people who are abused, about 85% of the time it's a woman and 15% of the time it's a man. I do believe that that uh, abuse, that men experiencing abuse is underreported um, because I think it's very difficult, um, especially for anybody to identify it, but men um, as well. So it, it is a problem. It is a problem for both. Um, so I talked about, um, power and control. Um, what you'll find is that, um, you know, there are, are some professions where you might see abuse more frequently. And that is in, uh, for example, um, uh, those who are in very powerful, um, positions hmm. politically, um, people who might carry a gun, those type. So you'll find, I, I think you find the extremes, the people who are there for the power and the people who are there because of the true heart that they have for loving and serving people. Mm -hmm. um, but that might help you understand the power and control dynamic a little bit. Is, is there some data about just how pervasive this is? Because of course we're shocked to hear it's happening in the church. It's it's horrendous that's happening at all, but how how much does it actually happen? This is where you're gonna be shocked. Um, one out of three women will experience abuse in her lifetime. And that statistic comes, um, is actually about physical abuse um, for women ages 15 to 44. So, you know, you'll see other people use the one in four. So, you know, it's out there, but one in three, one in four, whichever, whichever statistic you want to use, it's huge. I mean, if you're a woman, think about two of your friends, uh, two of your closest friends. And, you know, the statistics tell us that one of the three of you are um, more than likely in an abusive situation and the others might not know. Um, can, so, can, you, can you, can you pick that apart for us? Cause I think about when I read about sexual assault, there's a fairly broad definition of sexual assault mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a scale. And so we may be thinking about different things. How do we define domestic, the, the, uh, the abuse you were just talking about with one in three? Um, so physical abuse can be anything from, um, the actual, hitting. I mean, that's what people think of physical abuse. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, even though I had been pushed up against a wall with the hands around my neck, um, I hadn't been hit. So I didn't think that I had experienced physical abuse, when in truth, it's any physical aggression that would make you um, even feel afraid. So if I were trying to exit a room um, and the door was used um, to block me or to hit me um, or um, even um, getting in someone's face um, and, you know, um, you know, da, 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 you know, that kind of thing um, is um, is physical abuse. It's 
anything that is a threat or intimidation that makes you in fear for your imminent, uh, the legal um, terminology is in fear of imminent harm or danger. Okay. Okay. And so, and that plays into the power controls. I don't really have to hit you to control you. And that's what I'm really trying to get out of that situation. Correct. Correct. And uh, someone who does, who physically abuses, there are a, a wide variety of kinds of abusers, but somebody who physically abuses um, may only have to, to physically hit the person once or do something, you know, we see a lot of um, guns out on tables, um, you know, polishing and cleaning the gun, things like that. Um, and that's still a threat. Um, it's a, yeah. Yeah. Just knowing I can, I, I remember at one point reading a thing about lynchings in the South and someone was saying, well, there weren't as many lynchings as we're led to believe. And the, the, the point was though, right. But you don't, you don't need a lot to send them the right message and, and get the control. And even that's a similar thing, control and power. Um, can be used the same way as you just need to know it can happen. It can happen. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And then the, the threat of that. Um, and, and so then um, you, so you had a before COVID. So Hagar sisters has been around for a little while. So before COVID, what were you doing and what's the transition you've been in now that we're in COVID and hopefully someday after COVID. Yeah. Hopefully. Um, so Hagar sisters, you know, the the women originally started meeting in my house and then we got so big, we had to move to a confidential location. Um, and um, then we even had so many women that we started a second site. So we we do the services of, you know, the the first call a woman makes to Hagar sisters there's a lot of, of listening and affirming. And uh, honestly, for us to say, you know, do we think Hagar Sisters is the right place for them? Um, um, but women who question if they're being abused, women who are or women who have in the past been abused are all the right people for Hagar Sisters. So when a sister calls, uh, when a woman calls, you know, we listen, we um, talk with her uh, about her experience, and then we invite her to become a sister. Um, and if she, if she did, you know, when she was a sister, she'd receive um, advertisements or notifications of the support groups and she could go in to uh, start the process of the curriculum. So we have a, a support group courses, and within those courses, we also have sharing and prayer and everything we do is biblically based um, because, you know, we really exist in that space between domestic violence knowledge and what does God say? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so we have the courses now um, the, the August before COVID hit, I, I really felt God was calling us to make a dramatic move um, with the organization, we were facing some challenges like being able to reach um, women who are outside of the, the white suburban track of, between Lexington and Danvers where our sites were. You know, it was heartbreaking that, uh, that these really weren't, especially for women of color, um, weren't accessible. So with the the geographical um challenges and then we were seeing um you know we provide such high quality care for the women that we serve um that the price the cost of serving each sister was going higher and higher um and we really needed to have a more cost effective model and that's when you know i really felt god calling us to make that dramatic move so we actually paused our services um, and uh, connected with a very high level um, consultant who helped us as we just went back and completely readdressed the organization from um, mission statement, um, 
you know, through our theory of change and everything. So we ended up learning that um, the, the best solution for us was an, an online solution. So we have completely re-engineered our in-person services um, to an online service. Now, when I say online, a lot of people say, oh, well, you're doing support group courses via Zoom. Yeah, we absolutely are doing that. But we are doing so much more than that because our um, all of our course content and the exercises and uh, videos and things like that are all now on a platform that we refer to as a sister portal. So um, the, the exciting thing is that both of those challenges that I mentioned, any woman anywhere who has a computer or a laptop or even a smartphone can access our services. It removes the geographical barriers. And then it also, um, as, as we continue this shift, um, over the next five years, we'll end up serving 10 times the number of women at a third of the cost that it previously was. Um, so we uh, piloted for two semesters and this fall, our courses are um, just getting started. Uh, we kind of run on a semester basis. So I'd encourage anybody who uh, questions or has in the past uh, or knows that they're in an abusive situation to give us a call. And, um, and so, uh, so today, where are women you are serving? Is it um, so? Um, because we're so well known and respected in the Boston area, um, we again we really haven't done any advertising um, to get out there because we've been really getting things in place. Um, but we've had women from um, Colorado, from Tennessee, and New York State. Uh, last semester, who found us on the internet and, you know, couldn't believe that there was somebody that could speak to both of the issues that they were facing. And and so how, um, so if, if I'm questioning, I'm going to give you a, so how, how will I find you typically? Is it internet searches these days or is it referrals from other women or pastors or police or something else? It's all of the above. Okay. Um, we put cards um, that are outreach cards, business size cards in um, uh, the ladies' restrooms of our church partners. Um, we also give those cards to counselors and pastors to carry in their wallet. And, you know, anybody who really wants to advocate um, for safety for women Um so the cards get passed around and a woman will call and say, I've been carrying this card for three years. Um, and, you know, she's just found the courage to call. Um, we get referrals from Christian counselors. Um, we get referrals from pastors. Um, although women really are hesitant to disclose their experience um, of abuse to a pastor. We find that at churches, um, most of the women come to us by, you know, just very discreetly taking one of the cards and um, and taking that with them. We put them in each of the women's stalls so they'll have the privacy to actually pick one up and look at it. Um, um, so yeah, our, our problem has never been, are we going to have enough women? It's always been, how are we gonna serve so many women? Because they just keep coming and coming. And so if I, if I reach out uh, to your organization and I, um, you you guys uh, share with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm questioning or I know I'm being abused. Mm -hmm. um, and so you guys say, okay, this is the right solution for you. Let's assume that. Mm -hmm. what, what, um, what, what do I do next? What happens? Because mm -hmm. you, you talked about these support groups. What, is, what does that look like? Yes. So, um, so we've designed a new service that uh, we call a care plan. It's self-pay, so you would you would talk with one of our care coordinators. Um, you would both determine if Hagar Sisters is the right place for you or not, and um, then if once you become a sister, um, you receive a, a password, a unique ID um, and password to use the portal, and then you're you know we show you what's there. There's a welcome that tells you how to use the portal and 
uh, just how to stay safe using your technology and all of that. Um, but then going into the care plan, there are eight individual modules that they can go in and work at their own pace. Um, and if they want individual support, they can call the care coordinator or they can even go to a discussion group. But so once they go through those, um, then they go into um, their it's, it's time for them to be registered for a support group. So at the conclusion of that care plan, they're meeting one-on-one -on -one with a care coordinator to talk about the tools that they would have developed, you know, a self-care plan, a safety plan, a resource plan. Um, and they'll, they'll talk through those things. Um, and then uh, the care coordinator will enroll her in her first support group course. Um, the course is run about 10 or 11 weeks um, weekly. Right now they're on weeknights, um, but um, we do plan in the future to do uh, daytime offerings. Um, and we have a six course curriculum. You can attend one or you can attend all of them, um, but they, they really do build. A lot of domestic violence organizations go as far as saying, you know, this is what abuse is and, you know, this is how you should think about forgiveness and this is how you should think about uh, different things, but they really don't go deeper than that. And for us, you know, it, it really is about healing. It's, it's emotional and spiritual healing. How can you move into a healthy relationship in the future? Um, and, and honestly, so many women are, are, really angry at God. Um, you know, so it, it becomes a crisis of faith and not all women do, you know, um, but, you know, we really want to um, let them know that God hates abuse and that his desire is for us to live in peace and safety. And, and so, so I, so I'll go through, there's a curriculum I can go through and it sounded like if I, if I heard you right, that you're going to help me make sure with my technology, nobody knows I'm doing this curriculum. Absolutely. Right? Safety is our primary concern. And, and then I, I, I complete the curriculum and I'm going to wind up in a support group. Does that support group just go on forever or do people kind of opt in and out, opt out over time? Or is there an end date to a support group? Um, well, a support group will last um, 11 weeks. Okay. Um, so the support group is related to the courses. Um, right. And then, you know, once you finish a course, you have the option of registering for the next semester for the next course. Or if something happens, many of the women go back to work or they um, have to move or they're in the middle of a, a terrible court case. You know, so they need to take a break. They take a break and when they're ready, they come back. Okay. Um, but they still can get support and care from our care coordinators during that um, that period between courses. And is at some point in the curriculum, is there is there an emphasis on getting yourself to safety if you've not left or 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 is that more left to where their thinking is as it evolves? That's such a great question. This is so important. Um, Hagar Sisters doesn't have an agenda that a woman is to stay or leave. Okay. That is completely her decision, and it's between her and God. Now, we give the information um, and we, you know, help through group knowledge. You know, wh what has someone else tried in this situation? What's worked for you? Um, and things like that. But safety is addressed up front um, because a woman is at the, the greatest risk when she is thinking of leaving. Um, in fact, our, one of our first five women um, called me one night and said, you know, the, the FBI are here and they have a videotape with audio of my husband paying a hitman and drawing a floor plan. Um, and there had never been any physical violence before. He had thrown a fan across the room when he was angry, but the, the abuse really was emotional abuse um, to that point. So um, safety, 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 safety. 
Um, so one of the first modules that they do in the care plan is about safety. But each woman, you know, just because you leave doesn't mean that you're safe. Mm -hmm. Leaving can, you know, he, he's at the height of having lost power and control over you. So you're at the greatest risk um, at that point. So staying may actually be the safest thing for you until, you know, you can um, figure out what you want to do. And, you know, we believe that God can change lives. Um, and, and there are abusive partners who, who take on that responsibility and acknowledge and say, you know, yes, I, I did want power and control, you know, and, and, and they usually need a lot of help um, to get there and, and to stay accountable to not abuse. But we've had um, a handful of women reunite successfully with their abusive partners, and we celebrate that. So, um, you know, our goal is to provide the information and empower them to make the best decision that's right for them and to point them to God. Wow. Uh, you know, that's God has a plan for each of us. Yeah. Now, now you're clearly um, called uh, and gifted and equipped to be in this kind of ministry. Not all of us could say that we're not all called to it. We're not, but we're certainly not all equipped and gifted for it either. But if somebody is listening and they're like, Oh, I, I want to engage. I'm not, so I want to talk about women who may need your services, but, but the people who are um, sometimes we Christians, we hear something like this, it breaks our heart rightly. And we want to jump all over and do something. Help me understand what kind of um, credentialing or capabilities or training or, or how do I know it's really a calling versus I'm just angry at an injustice. Yeah. I love to talk about calling. It, it is one of the most tender things in my heart um, when I think about my whole experience. But um, uh, we don't have another hour, so I'll move forward with that. Um, but, you know, calling often happens with just that urging. And all you need to do is contact Hagar sisters and say, you know, this has really touched my heart. Um, you know, I don't know how or what I might do, but, um, you know, we would have you talk with our volunteer manager and understand your time availability, your interests, um, and then we would take it from there. Um, um, before we paused, we had 115 active volunteers um, that gave about $200,000 value of their time at Hagar Sisters. But one of the things that I think makes us unique as a nonprofit is that it is our volunteers who are doing the frontline ministry. Without our volunteers, we're nothing. So women um, working directly with the sisters, we provide all the training. Um, what people need to come with is um, Christian maturity, um, a heart for women, and a willingness to learn. Um, we have a, a 25 hour domestic violence um, certification program that we developed. Um, and it's um, everybody who interfaces with a sister um, goes through that training, plus they're trained on their specific job. So um, we have positions to work with the sisters that are um, for people who are not survivors. Um, but often those people really have a heart for people who have experienced trauma or they've walked through trauma themselves. Um, but they don't have to have. They just have to be compassion, compassion and care about domestic uh, violence issues. Um, and then we have people who are survivors. And this, um, as we've gone to an online system, you know, we'll be growing so quickly. We watched our care coordinators and how beautifully they worked with the sisters and they aren't survivors, 
So we said, well, in support group, we have two leaders and 10 women that spend this time together. So if we have one leader who is a survivor, and that's one of the things that makes us unique, and we have one woman who is um, not a survivor, but trained and compassionate, then you know it works perfectly. So we are taking people who are survivors um, and you know, we really need to understand, you know, what have they done? Uh, you know, how has God healed them from their experience of abuse? But there's a whole process that we go through and everything, but um, we really need people to become facilitators, assistant facilitators and care coordinators. And our team has grown. We went from seven down to three when we paused um, the or, uh, organization and we're ramping back up. We have seven and we have uh, three positions that are open right now. Um, and and I'll, I'll say it for you because you're too gracious to say it. Um, but if, if you're hearing this and saying, well, I want to engage, so I'm going to call and I'm going to say, this is what I want to do for you. Um, more often than not, that is not helpful <laughs> and the wrong approach. Or even God told me, I'm supposed to come and do this for you because I hear this from ministries all the time. The call needs to be, I think God might be calling me to this. How can I serve? Mm -hmm. um, because we get, I, I, you guys get so many calls from people who, yeah, that doesn't fit at all. And actually that's harmful because we just don't, you know, we, we have the right heart, but we just don't understand what's really needed yet. Right, right. Awesome. Um, the, the beauty is, you know, I, I remember being called to a position and um, everything the person described fit my background. And I called and I didn't get the person on the phone, but I said, I know you don't know me and I'm really not full of myself, but I have everything that you're looking at. I have this, I have this, I have this, I have this, you know, and, and within 24 hours I had, I had the job. Um, and, and it was in a Christian nonprofit. Um, but, you know, so enthusiasm is great. And if you have special skills that you want to use, certainly call and tell us that you want to use those skills. Um, but our process is set up to really help uh, understand what the right role, you know, um, would be. And, and we do take people that we need. Um, and, and right now we need a lot. <laughs> so. And, and so how would I find you then? Uh, go ahead. Perfect. You can look us up at our website, um, which is hagarssisters.org. Um, you have to spell Hagar, right? And you have to have the two S's together. Right. Uh, H-A-G-A-R-S, uh, sisters, S-I-S-T-E-R-S dot -E org. Um, and you can also um, call us. You can email us at info at hagarsisters.org. Um, but we, we love our volunteers yeah. and we're building such an amazing team. We, God is building an amazing team. That's great. And Ashley will put that URL, for the website and the email. And if you can't find it, just email us at Vision New England and we'll get you connected as well. Wonderful. I, I just thought when we first talked, Joyce, I forget how long ago it was. When we first talked, I thought it was so innovative um, to be thinking about how do I take this whole ministry online at a time where it was hard to meet in person anyway, um, mm -hmm. but that it could just have such bigger reach and impact. And so it's just amazing to hear there's women from all, all over the U.S., yeah. finding you guys that God is just bringing to you who really need love yes. and support and care. Well, and, and that this would have happened in August before even the first person contracted yeah. COVID, you yeah. know, and um, it's, it, it's, almost, it's almost like God had a plan, maybe. Oh, <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> yeah. You know, hindsight, looking back and saying, oh, this is why. This is why um, not only could we um, reach women that were trapped in their homes, but as the rate of abuse grew because of the pandemic, um, you know, we were able to scale up and, and reach so many more women uh, because, you know, the UN um, women's UN executive women's director, I, I can't get the, the name exactly right, but he caught referred to domestic abuse as a shadow pandemic, um, and um, really spoke out um, 
strongly about the issue of abuse increasing with COVID. And, and, and if I'm a, a pastor or a leader in my church, how can my church get involved in this? Mm. Um, you said that I was so gracious and wouldn't say something, but I'll say this, you can support us. <laughs> right. <laughs> especially if you're sending us women, <laughs> you can send us support. Um, but I, I think the important thing, and when we do training for churches, which we've paused uh, for the time being, it should, it should return probably next fall. Um, but please know, abuse is so highly complex that you'd never know. Um, so your goal is to listen and to refer her to Hagar's sisters. Um, you know, she doesn't need scripture. She needs love and listening, uh, compassion, and being asked, what can I do to help you? Um, yeah. That's a great answer. And, and prayer, right? So certainly we can be oh. praying for you guys too. Oh. And for the abusive partner, research shows that when an abusive partner goes through batterer intervention um, uh, training, um, that their success rate doubles when a pastor is involved. Wow, that's good to know. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, so on both fronts, assistance is needed. And, and if I'm someone who's hearing this and saying, hey, I think I need to talk to someone about this, I can yes. find you again through the same website, hagarsisters.org. And yeah. info at, at hagarsisters.org. Yes, absolutely. Um, if you go on our website, there's also a confidential number. Um, so if your abusive partner might see the numbers on your phone and call them to see who you've been calling um, or research them, you know, the phone is just answered, hi, mm -hmm. <laughs> hello. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and always leave your phone number and or email and let us know if it's safe for us to return your call um, because that's not always the case. Yeah, that's a great point. That's great. Joyce, thank you so much for sharing with us uh, and making time and for doing such a vital ministry and be, being willing to step out in faith and do it in innovative ways. Um, that's not, it's, it's not always easy for us church people to change. <laughs> and so uh, that took great courage and faith. But uh, I, I remember uh, a professor, he said, if you want to see God, if you want to see God work, you have to take risks on God. And so you guys took a risk on God and got to see him work. It's true. There's a quote that that I love, which is um, you never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, God really started building that faith muscle um, in me a long time ago and through my own experience and um, the really tough choices I had to make, um, you know, I, he really prepared me for making a tough decision like that and surrounded me with wonderful people. Well, thank, thank you for doing it and thank you for sharing it and thank you for your ministry. Um, and I just, I just pray God will be blessing uh, you and using this to bring you more volunteers and to help more women know about this ministry so that they can plug into it where they need to. Excellent. So thanks for doing that. And for our audience, thank you for joining us again. Uh, I hope you heard something in here that broke your heart, but encouraged you as well. Uh, and and uh, pray, uh, is God calling you to do something personally in this space? And if so, you've heard how to, to plug into it as well. Uh, and so, uh, and I'd like to thank our producer, Ashley Pitkin, uh, for putting this together. If you liked it, please share it, follow us. If you think there's someone who needs to hear about it, um, discreetly figure out how to do that too. Uh, but you can find it on Facebook, YouTube, Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify as the Church in Action podcast. Uh, and you can find it also on visionnewengland.org. Our next podcast, next week we'll have Pastor Cindy Cabral, who's the pastor of Lively Stone Christian Fellowship which is a great church in Brockton, Mass. I mean, she's, she's, you're going to love hearing from her. She's a lot of fun to talk to uh, and has some great insights. Um, but she'll be sharing how we, how we share the love of Jesus with people uh, evangelistically. How do we, we talk about doing justice so we can share Jesus? What does it look like in her context to share Jesus and see what God is doing in her, in her ministry? 
And so thanks very much again. Uh, see, see you next time. Thanks, Joyce. And there's going to be some other videos po posted uh, in the Facebook feed so you can read it. You can see those as well. Thanks again, Joyce. God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.